So we're going to continue now the program with uh, uh, endovascular alternatives in aortic arch pathology uh, by Dr. Cherry Abraham. Dr. Abraham recently moved to uh, Portland where he's the uh, director of the uh, aortic center at, at uh, Ohio, at, Ohio, at uh, Oregon, um, uh, OHSU. OHSU, Oregon, what is that? Health and Science. Health and Science. Science. Thank you. So. Thanks, Dr. Canones, and thanks to Dr. to Brian Dierbertus for inviting me. These are my uh, disclosures. I have a, an additional disclosure. The program, um, at some point in the program, it says that I'm actually from Vancouver. I'm actually not from Vancouver. I came and moved from Montreal to Portland, Oregon. Uh, my port of entry was Vancouver. So I don't know how you know that, but that's taking immigration reform to a, a completely different level. Um, so my subject is aortic arch aneurysm, specifically endovascular repair of aortic arch aneurysms. What we do know is that they have a fairly poorly defined natural history. They're fairly rare aneurysms, and we do know that they don't just generally have, we don't generally have isolated aortic arch aneurysms. Usually they creep into the proximal aorta and the ascending aorta, or they go down into the distal thoracic aorta, and that kind of often changes the management. Um, we've seen from the talks today in centers with... Uh, expertise, specific expertise, expertise in high volume, uh, the results are pretty good, especially with better techniques with cardiopulmonary bypass and deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. But overall, if you go through all centers in North America, the perioperative death and stroke rate is still significant. And uh, the, the nice thing about endovascular uh, repair of arch aneurysms, it gives you an option in some patients who are either, have, who are either too sick for the open repair or perhaps have anatomical constraints such as redo surgery or false aneurysms. Uh, this is a classic patient uh, that might be offered this kind of technique, a patient who's had previous coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, has significant comorbidities, and has an isolated arch aneurysm, and we'll find out what happened with this patient a little later on in the presentation. So what are the challenges of aortic endovascular arch repair? Well, it's obviously the geometry is complex. Uh, when we first started doing this, we knew we were going to have some problems with how we were going to figure out we were going to get apposition of the inner curve of the arch with the endovascular stent graft. And the big question is what's going to happen long term with the high blood flow, the pulse, high pulsatility, and the uh, great dynamic strain in the uh, proximal arch. I used to show this picture of a debranching procedure and thinking that it wasn't a great procedure, but I actually think it is a pretty good procedure when it's actually done by the right people and with the uh, right anatomy. And what I mean by that is it's either got to be done by a cardiac surgeon who's obviously familiar with the ascending aorta and or a vascular surgeon who is, but you know, by and large, the newer vascular trainees are just not trained and comfortable working with the ascending aorta anymore. And so it's really going to be in the future probably cardiac surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons who are doing these types of procedures. Um, the other thing is, is you really have to make sure you're sewing to a, a fairly normal ascending aorta. Uh, otherwise, you're going to run into problems or failure. And these are not new techniques, the endovascular arch aneurysm repair. We saw uh, reports out of Japan, uh, a pioneer in vascular surgery, as you saw. Dr. Tim Tudor was the first to come up with the Tudor arch graft, which introduced us to arch aneurysm repair with endovascular means. Okay. However, it didn't have great results unless it was Tim Tudor doing the case. And uh, perhaps that was because he realized some of the limitations and some of the, th the things you had to be uh, careful about. And so that sp spurred us to go on and, and try to figure out other ways we could treat this uh, uh, pathology. And we had pretty good success in the abdominal aorta with endovascular fenestrated grafts, for, as you saw with Brian's talk. And we thought, well, why not use this in the arch? We could use scallops for the innominate artery combined with fenestrations for the carotid artery with the preloaded catheter technique, and I'll show you what the preloaded catheter does. This is the uh, type of anatomy that could be treated. And what all the preloaded pre catheter does is once you send out the wire through the preloaded catheter from the right arm, you snare that wire, and then while two people are holding on either end and you're deploying the stent graft, that preloaded wire keeps that fenestration or scallop in line with the target artery. You deploy the graft, and then at the end of the case, you've got a nice 
completion angiogram, you still had to do in this particular case a debranching procedure because this patient only had a scallop for the innominate, and it all looks very good. The only problem is, is that preloaded wire was actually often putting a lot of pressure on the base of the innominate artery, and as people who are familiar with this, often the base of the innominate artery has some disease, and what we were seeing was these patients were ending up with a, an alarming rate of uh, neurological events. Uh, I won't spend too much time on debranching. I share the same uh, th uh, thoughts uh, with Tim about debranching, especially in the arch. I think it's uh, probably a procedure that shouldn't be done, mainly because uh, uh, um, the um, not the debranching, sorry, the chimney technique. Chimneys don't look like that. They usually have more of a gutter, and when you have a gutter that gives you a type 1A endo leak in the arch, there really is no bailout. So I really don't like that technique for the procedure. Uh, we are going to see more and more um, options in the future, certainly outside of the United States, uh, through the custom aid program or special access. You have access to some of these. The Medtronic device that you see here, the sidearm, the Valiant Mona Lisa graft is under feasibility trials right now. So you may actually see this graft in the United States uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, the Gore sidearm device, similar but a little different because it re relies on retrograde flow. But it's not. It's not. Um, uh, it's not. It's certainly currently right now in feasibility trials, and I think what you're going to see is once that's approved, that people are going to start using it not in non-approved uh, uh, anatomy for zone one and zone two, and we'll see what happens with that. Not to be outdone, the Bolton uh, company came out with their uh, branched graft, uh, which basically is predicated on their relay technology. Again, it's available, available outside the United States in uh, custom-made programs, and we'll probably see that in the feasibility trial at some point as well. Uh, desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes in patients. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, this is a pa uh, of an animation of a, of a patient who is high risk that you resort to some off-label uses. Here, this patient is having their carotid perfused from their femoral artery, and then they had just a standard thoracic graft, and then what they came down is, and they did in situ fenestrations. And my, our cardiac surgeon in Portland actually did this recently with a patient who was symptomatic, had had a previous type A dissection repair, and actually the patient did very well, especially when you protect their carotids with anterograde perfusion and clamping them so they don't have neurological events. But what I really want to talk about is a little bit is the arch branch graft that I have more experience, especially in Canada. I haven't uh, obviously done any since I've come to uh, Portland. Uh, in Oregon, but I just did one with uh, Dr. Beck in Florida on Thursday. And the principle is fairly uh, straightforward. You deploy the branch graft, and then from the supraortic vessels, you get into the branches and then extend with a covered stent into the innominate or one of your supraortic vessels. And on the carotid side, you come by either a carotid subclavian bypass and extend into the carotid or a direct puncture into the carotid artery and extend from a covered stent into the uh, carotid artery. Obviously, you have to get good planning uh, of the procedure, as we saw with the abdominal. It's no different. Uh, it's a modular transfemoral multi-branch stent graft. Uh, this is what the uh, latest generation looks like. Um, yeah, it's all predicated. How do you get those branches to get to lie on the greater curve of the arch? It's all based on this uh, pre-curved nitinol cannula. Uh, that's really done a very good job. Uh, the latest additions have the proform technology so that you don't have problems with apposition of the uh, first proximal covered stent. Um, this is, uh, we, we call this a custom made branch, but this, interestingly enough now, uh, there's been over 150 implants worldwide, and by and large, the majority have the same configuration of the innominate and carotid branch at 1130 and 1230. So, really, the only thing that's varying is the proximal diameter and makes you think that we're not far off from possibly doing a trial even here in the United States. Uh, so how do you do this device? I used to do this as a first stage procedure with the carotid subclavian and then follow it up later. I now do the carotid subclavian at the same time. It's a transfemoral insertion of the stent graft. Obviously positioning is important. We are deploying it under rapid pacing or uh, a venous occlusion balloon. But I just had this conversation with Tim. Uh, I recently did a couple of cases in Colombia with Dr. Timuron, and we actually weren't able to pace the, the, the heart, and we actually brought the patient down to about 60 or 70 systolic, and the patient didn't have any evidence of any windsock. So I wonder if you actually really do need to pace these patients. Um, once you get the graft positioned, you have to make sure that you're distal to the coronary arteries. 
And you really have to make sure you have a good knowledge of the markings of this graph. There's four markers here proximal to your first branch. There's four markers distal to your second branch. And you have to line those up to the supraortic vessels. Uh, once you've done that, once you've deployed the graph, you just come down, as I said before, you just come down through supraortic vessels into the branches and uh, uh, place your covered stent into the uh, uh, innominate or the left common carotid artery. Sometimes it gets a little confusing as to which branch you're in. We use this technique where we take the pigtail catheter and you see how it deforms there. That means you're in the proximal innominate branch. If you actually go by that branch, and deform on the carotid branch, you know you're in the carotid branch. The nice thing about being in the United States is you have intravascular ultrasound. We're too cheap in Canada to use intravascular ultrasound, and you don't have to do this technique. You can easily use intravascular ultrasound to determine whether you're actually in the branches. Uh, when you remove the, the, uh, uh, the nitinol cannula, it can be very traumatic, so you have to make sure you protect all the work that you've done here by placing uh, balloon angiopl angioplasty balloons, and just it just stabilizes the whole repair while you remove the delivery system. So the cook has done a pretty good job of keeping it uh, in within its inclusion criteria, and that's really the ascending aortic diameter. It has to be less than 38 millimeters. Otherwise, you're maybe not really dealing with a normal ascending aorta, and that might lead to problems mid to long term. Uh, the proximal distal landing zones, I think that's being pretty chintzy, the 20 millimeters. You really need more than 20 millimeters with these kinds of graphs, especially in, in the ascending aorta. Um, Tortuosity is all relative, as we're about to see. Uh, you try to have minimal calcification because stroke is really one of the uh, Achilles uh, heels of these uh, procedures. So the first case that we did actually for this uh, arch branch was in Montreal in 2009. And this is a good example of what you can achieve when you really do collaborate uh, in a scientific way a little bit with companies. And it's not all about making money. You actually do contribute to innovation. And this was actually the first device what it, what it looked like, and it's very different than what the device you see today. And we had actually external branches instead of internal branches. We thought uh, the creator of this graph, David Hartley, thought that this would facilitate us getting from the superiority vessels into the branch. And again, this is one of the first cases that had this pre-curved nitinol cannula that ensures that the branches get up on the greater curve of the arch. And so here we had a, a good result in the operating room with no endoleak. Uh, the problem was on the CT scan postoperative, we could see an endoleak, and it looked like a type 1 endoleak. And sure enough, on diagnostic angiography, the problem was apposition of the inner curve of the ascending aorta. Uh, we, we were able to repair that by just going retrograde and embolizing the sac. But again, uh, we really learned by this first case. We learned by our mistakes. We changed the external branches to the current internal branches, and we changed the markings. And then the other thing we did is we modified that first stent and now it has the proform technology so that we could take care of that uh, bird's beak problem on the inner curve of the ascending aorta. The other nice uh, thing about this device ha that it has the last trigger wire you don't release. And it, when you put up your second piece, if your aneurysm goes into the descending thoracic aorta, there's always that risk that when you put up that second piece that you might push your uh, branch graft uh, proximally and really ruin all the nice work that you've done in the arch. So this gives you a, an opportunity to hold on to the device, and contralaterally, you can come up with the uh, iliac. Sorry, with the uh, thoracic aortic dissection. Here we've held on to the branch graft, and we've come contralaterally with the next piece, and that was a nice uh, adjustment that Cook made. So subsequently, we had good results with our second case. We were so confident with our second case, we had a nice completion CT reconstruction there that we really started overthinking it. And we thought we did this patient with a uh, bovine configuration. And instead of sticking to the uh, standard configuration, we started playing with the configurations, thinking that we could predict the supraortic vessels and the coming in from the supraortic vessels and, how, and getting into the actual branches. And that proved to be a mistake, as you can see here with the uh, 3D CT. Um, we have compression of the uh, carotid branch because we screwed around with the uh, configuration, we were able to see how it's compressed right there. We were able to remedy that with a balloon expandable stand, and the patient did fine. We weren't so lucky in our fourth case. Again, we tried to think a little bit too much about it. We tried to predict the way the supraortic vessels were coming off and how we would get into it, and so we changed the configuration, and we were unable to uh, get into that uh, innominate branch, and this turned into a, a bit of a disaster. We ended up having to perfuse the... Uh, 
carotid with the right femoral to carotid bypass. The patient had a, a stroke, but he fully recovered, thank goodness. Subsequent to that, we went back to the regular configuration, and we've had excellent results. And worldwide, they've really had excellent results, um, with stroke being uh, in the range of 7 to uh, 12%. So what are the technical considerations? Uh, tortuosity is still an issue, as I'm about to show. Uh, you can't really rotate this graft once it's in the arch, so you really have to make sure that the uh, branches end up on the greater curve. And again, that night, pre-curved nitinol cannula helps to do that. The status of the aortic valve is extremely important. You can't do this in a mechanical valve. Uh, you can do it in a tissue valve. Um, we've learned from the Tudor arch graft uh, how to avoid injuries to the left ventricle. Obviously now people are more facile with uh, TAVR and more and more procedures requiring a stiff wire in the ventricle. So I think we've learned from all that experience as well. The Achilles heel again is the stroke. And uh, the less you can uh, do manipulation in the arch similar to carotid stenting, the less risk of strokes that you're gonna have. Contraindications, as I mentioned, metallic uh, prostheses, ascending aorta is greater than 38 millimeters. Tortuosity is a relative contraindication. Uh, the other thing is anatomy. So this is the going back to that case that I showed you before. So this patient had coronary artery bypass grafts approximately. So the standard configuration of a graft would probably cover those. So we ended up uh, coming up with a better design. We actually designed this scallop approximately to, a, to um, uh, account for those uh, uh, fairly distally placed coronary artery bypass grafts. Here's a picture of the graft. And I did this with the uh, vascular surgeon in Toronto, and we deployed the graft, and we subsequently covered the coronary bypass, and the patient had profound ST elevation, profound hypotension, and while the vascular surgeon was muttering something about us murdering the patient, I quickly pulled on the graft distally. The ST segment elevation went away, the blood, blood, blood pressure came back, but unfortunately I pulled that in, uh, carotid branch too distal. And this brings me back, one of the only things I don't like about Tim Tudor is that he's always right. And he always told me, don't ever close that subclavian artery when you do your first stage of the carotid subclavian bypass. And this is why we actually, we were able to salvage this case by then coming from the subclavian artery into that carotid branch and making it into a subclavian to carotid bypass instead of the other way around. And this patient did fine. Um, I'm just going to skip that. Uh, this is a, a good example of pushing the limit again. I did this with a cardiac surgeon in Manitoba. Uh, this is a patient with pretty funky anatomy, and you can imagine such a tight arch there. How is those um, branches going to end up in the right place? But we were able to put this uh, branched arch graft, and we actually had a very good result. And it just showed me that the pre-curved night and cannula really was a reliable adjustment to the, to the technology and would always ensure that the uh, branches were on the greater curve. Uh, we all have uh, patients that we wish we could take back. This is a complex patient who had previous uh, fem-fem, previous infrarenal aneurysm repair, thoracal abdominal aneurysm, severe tortuosity with an arch aneurysm as well as a thoracal abdominal aneurysm. I felt that we could treat him with an arch aneurysm repair and then seal at the distal thoracic aorta. I was a bit worried with the tortuosity about how we would get those branches up there and how we would get them lined up. But as you can see, I, I used kind of like a Buddy Lundquist technique. This is pretty severe tortuosity. And we were able to get the um, arch branch graft up, and it actually lined up pretty well. And we were pretty happy with the, uh, the technical result. We got the branches no problem. It showed us that, again, that pre-curved night and all cannula saved us, but... Um, you know, with severe anatomy comes severe complications. I managed to get a good technical result, but I also managed to push a lot of thrombus into his um, uh, spinal cord, and he ended up with paraplegia. So um, can you do this in patients with dissection? And this is a case that I did with a cardiac surgeon in Calgary. Had a previous ascending repair. Complex descending, uh, sorry, complex uh, arch dissection anatomy. And uh, we were a little unsure about whether this was the right thing to do, but we, we, uh, he didn't really have much of a choice. I had a cardiac surgeon who really didn't want to bring this patient back to the uh, operating room. He didn't do so well neurologically the first time with circ arrest. He really didn't think he was going to do well the second time. So we placed an arch branch graft. Here's the anatomy. A good landing zone proximally, proximally which always makes things a bit easier. 
there's the dissection with some complex anatomy at the arch and you always wonder if you're going to have a good success and be able to line up the branches but we were able to and again when you treat any chronic aneurysmal dilatation of dissections you the the outcome or the goal of trying to get a seal distally is different than when you're treating just a regular aneurysm what you're really trying to do is get false lumen thrombosis and that's exactly what we did this patient did pretty well with false lumen thrombosis of the descending thoracic and in the arch and the patient did pretty well so the one things that we don't know the long-term durability i think we will in the next five to ten years and uh, basically, uh, I don't know if this is, you're ever going to see this in the United States, but I'm hopeful that we are going to get a trial based on the fact that, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of these patients are not really as custom-made as we think with the branches. They're just uh, the proximal diameter is different. So perhaps it's not in the dis far distant future that we'll have uh, this. Um, I love your city. I love your hospital. And maybe next time I'll bring my family. As you can see, they'll probably fit right in here. Thank you. <laughs>